Peter, some neck. How many people attend these seminars, uh, Ivan? Well, we about between 30 and 40. Okay, good. Yeah, so you won't be seeing them, except only two of us will be on the screen. Mm -hmm. Good. All of you can ask questions through the chat function. Okay, good. No I'll be doing that, yeah. I missed uh, I missed Sedzan's uh, talk, so I need to find it on YouTube, right? Uh, on YouTube, yeah, it was it was yeah. very um, good. So we'll, we'll start in about a minute or two. At okay. Past. I'm opening the room um, now so people come in and then we can start on that again. Easy going away. Jimmy does not. The shadow is not. We are talking in such meter mode. At some point, I will have to share the my screen for a few graphs uh, from opinion polls. I hope it, I, I will be successful in that. <laughs> I turn. Okay. We'll, we'll begin. Um, a very warm welcome to all those who have joined us uh, for this afternoon here in Vienna. Uh, welcome to the library of the Institute for Human Sciences. Uh, and I'm very happy to have our third speaker in our series of Europe Futures Fellows in this academic year, 2020-21. And it's... Uh, Ioanni Armakolas, uh, who is a senior research fellow at Eliamep. Those of you who don't know what Eliamep is, it is a think tank, one of the most prominent think tanks in Greece, uh, Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy. Ioanni is also a professor of comparative politics of Southeastern Europe at the Department of Balkan, Slavic and Oriental Studies at the University of Macedonia in Thessaloniki, Greece. He has held numerous uh, fellowships, uh, mostly in the United Kingdom, at, at Oxford, and also at, uh, in Ireland, and is the author of a number of uh, books and um, uh, articles. He's a prominent scholar of the region of Southeastern Europe, the Western Balkans. Uh, he speaks the languages uh, of the region, or most of them and is a friend and colleague of, of many years. Uh, he will speak today uh, on, uh, I think, a very uh, timely subject. Uh, as you've seen from the announcement, the title is Learning from the PRESPA Agreement, or PRESPES in Greek. Is there a Southeast European way of settling disputes, or should there be one? Of course, uh, and I'll say only this before I give the floor to Ioanni, uh, the uh, blaze of the war in Nagorno-Karabakh between Azerbaijan and Armenia is just another lesson for us all that uh, what we call frozen conflicts that have been on and that remain unresolved for decades. Let's just note Kashmir that has been unresolved for 70 years between Pakistan and India are prone to every now and then flare up and cause enormous human 
casualties, uh, death, destruction, and displacement of people. So the PRESPA agreement uh, couched within the Western Balkans, I think has many lessons for uh, other disputes that are unresolved in the region, but also further afield. But that we will discuss uh, after Ioanni gives his presentation, which will be anywhere between 30 and 40 minutes. So Ioanni, please take the floor. And it's a great pleasure to have you as a fellow this year. Thank you very much, Ivan. Thanks for the kind words. And of course, it's a, it's a great pleasure and an honor for me to, to join Europe's Futures Fellows. Um, and I look forward to the discussions that we will be having in the coming months and, of course, for the exchange of ideas today. Um, what I will outline today is the research project that I will be working on during my fellowship. My main focus will be to develop a comprehensive understanding of the policy process and the dynamics involved in the settlement of the name dispute. And after drawing conclusions from the, the case of the name dispute, I aim to compare and contrast with other cases and all that in order to reach some broader conclusions about how European integration shapes the political conditions surrounding bilateral disputes. I would like to stress from the beginning that, of course, this is the start of the research project. And uh, what I will share with you today is only preliminary ideas and findings, pending, of course, further, further investigation in the coming months. Now, what are the main research questions of, of my project for the Institute for Human Sciences? Through the thorough examination of the PRESPA process, uh, let's say the before, the during, and the after of the negotiations and the signing, my research aims to understand the domestic and the international political calculations informing critical decisions. It also aims to examine how these critical decisions were underpinned by the influence of foreign actors, especially the EU, but also the US, and also international processes such as the European integration, of course, but also NATO enlargement. Uh, specifically, when it comes to the EU, the research project, uh, my research aims to understand how the membership perspective of Southeast Europe changes the political dynamics of disputes. How does EU membership perspective change the balance of power between sides? How it changes the policy thinking of factors and the overall also strategic calculus? How European integration overall shapes the political context of the decision-making process when it comes to disputes? And finally, as a, a, like a policy question, policy research question, what lessons can be drawn for EU policy making and how EU policies on the basis of the findings that hopefully uh, will be insightful, uh, how EU policies and tools may be refashioned in order to optimize positive influence on the part of Brussels and the EU on the settlement of disputes. Now, uh, when it comes to the policy process or that I will investigate, I will focus on three distinct but interrelated phases. The first phase will be the decision-making process that led to the uh, kind of foreign policy change in both countries and the decision to enter negotiations. Here, very simply, I will try to investigate the three whys, why the two sides decided to embark on negotiations, why they didn't do that earlier, and why at that particular moment in time. The second and more central um, uh, part of the phase, policy phase that I will investigate is the conduct of the negotiations and the signing of the agreement, especially with a focus on key obstacles and how these key obstacles were handled. Here I will focus on issues such as how the two sides treated the legacy and the experience of past negotiations, uh, whether the comprehensiveness, the all-inclusiveness of the agreement allowed for creative solutions to sensitive issues, how key contentious provisions such as the Ergaomnes clause, the decision to change the constitution of North Macedonia, the um, uh, radical revisiting of the uh, historical narrative of antiquity, or the provisions on Macedonian nationality and language. These are controversial on either side of the, of the two of the dispute, con controversial provisions. So how all these provisions were uh, included, or how the decision was made to include these provisions, and how they were negotiated and agreed upon. And the third phase of the investigation of the policy process that I will investigate is the aftermath of the agreement and the implementation, of course. And this includes the turbulent ratification process, which we all know was very controversial, 
the ambiguous implementation, especially after the, uh, a new anti-PRESPA government came to power in, in, in Athens and changed the, the previous working relationship between the two sides. Now, underpinning dimension in all these uh, three phases and policy process will be, of course, the role of the external actors, especially the EU, but also the US, because I think it's very important for comparative purposes. Now, uh, I will start by outlining what I would call the business as usual option for, for, for our discussion today. Because the name dispute was often seen by internationals as a needless path, often also incomprehensible path, and its emotional weight was not fully understood and comprehended, the success of the PRESPA deal is often portrayed as a long awaited and unsurprising development. This weakens, I think, our understanding of the nuances of the process uh, and also lessens the importance of the implications of this process. I argue that uh, reaching the PRESPA agreement was anything but a natural option. And that instead, if one examines the structural conditions of the, of the dispute, the business and as usual option, as I call it, was a more likely scenario. Now, why was that the case? In order to settle the dispute, both sides needed to enter complex negotiations that would inevitably bring difficult choices and compromises. Uh, both sides were accustomed to perceiving their own arguments as historically, politically, and legally just. And then a compromise would inevitably be seen uh, by politicians, but also by the wider public as concessions, if not a sellout to the other side. In contrast, there were significant incentives for both sides to continue the same track of non-settling the dispute, perhaps with only some concept, cosmetic changes uh, to melt the ice uh, in relations between the two sides since we had a change of governments in, 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 in Skopje. Uh, in fact, both sides, uh, as we may uh, see, uh, thought that they could avoid swallowing the bitter pill. In other words, negotiating and agreeing on a compromise entailed high costs with uncertain, even if significant returns. Now, why the business as usual was a very likely option. Uh, for Greece, reopening the issue would force Greek society first face the harsh reality that its northern neighbors had been known everywhere as Macedonia. And the compromise agreement would mean that the neighbors would forever, and with the explicit approval of Greece this time, use the term Macedonia, even if with some geographic qualifier. There was also the not ungrounded fear that the use of any geographic qualifier after an agreement would fade in time, with time, leaving the country being called simply as Macedonia and with Greece having no diplomatic recourse to fight back. All these were highly unpopular prospects that could easily backfire for the Greek government. At the same time, um, the Greek public, uh, the public opinion, the Greek public has traditionally been highly supportive of tough diplomatic action against Balkan neighbors, not only North Macedonia, but others also. To give an example from the period of the Bucharest summit in 2008, when Athens effectively blocked a firearms entry into NATO, according to opinion polls of the time, 84% of Greeks approved a Greek government veto on firearms accession. That means very widespread approval across, across uh, government and opposition divide, of course. And this, despite the fact that according to the same polls, one in two Greece thought at the time that the name Macedonia had been lost for good and Greece could not win this diplomatic battle. So it was a, a lost diplomatic battle, but Greeks wanted a tough action anyway. Um, thus the diplomatic cost for the Greek government was high, but the cost of maintaining the existing situation was seemingly much lower. Athens has borne the diplomatic cost of blocking Skopje's membership to Western institutions, even if uh, the blocking in the case of NATO was deemed illegitimate by the International Court of Justice. For the Greek side, uh, as it was often uh, called, the, the issue was diplomatically parked, in diplomatic terms parked. And Greece would maintain the situation with limited international cost for longer periods, waiting maybe in the future for more favorable circumstances. And in any case, for Greek political elites, evading uh, serious negotiations meant that the issue was kept out of the policy agenda and far from the Greek public eye, which of course meant preventing 
popular backlash over the use of the term Macedonia by, by the neighbors. Um, similarly, I would say for the side of North Macedonia, the potential cost of reaching an agreement was very high. Changing a country's name at the behest of a neighbor was unusual and highly controversial. The diplomatic battle over the name was experienced in traumatic terms by ethnic Macedonians who saw in it the negation of their very identity. Any compromise, especially if as extensive as it was agreed upon in Prespa, was to be very contentious. The country was, after all, internationally recognized as Republic of Macedonia by roughly 150 uh, countries, including four out of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, quite widespread um, uh, recognition as the Republic of Macedonia. And the international uh, use of the name was also uniform, widespread, with firearm being reserved practically only for official documents of international organizations. For the overwhelming majority of ethnic Macedonians, uh, there was absolutely no um, question that they were just in their position and they perceived um, the Greek uh, diplomatic campaign as a blackmail or at best as an unjust but futile endeavor, an endeavor that was uh, bound to fail. So the negotiations for reaching an agreement were as a result to entail potentially high cost also for the government in North Macedonia, with business as usual being seen as a preferable option for many officials and also, of course, for ordinary citizens. Now, let me at this point, uh, because I have already, already raised the issue, spend a few minutes to review the situation when it comes to the public opinion in the two countries. And if I would have to summarize it uh, at the outset, I would say that in the case of North Macedonia, we have had an evolution from a highly negative and rejectionist attitude two initial hopes when negotiations started, and then finally to frustration when the full extent of the necessary compromises became evident. In contrast, very differently, in Greece, we have had a much more rejectionist and negative public opinion throughout, from the beginning until the end. And now I'll try to share a few graphs, if I'm successful. Um, and I don't see the graph. Uh, let me see. Um, let's see it now. Hmm. Okay, we see the graphs now. You see it now. Okay, so um, I will start with a few uh, poll data from polling data from North Macedonia, and we go back a few months before the start of the. Uh, access uh, of the uh, negotiations for the PRESPA, uh, and we see how negative the, the picture is about uh, for Greece. What is your opinion of Greece? Negative 70%. Describe political relations with Greece, bad 80%. Um, we, we go on uh, uh, two, two years later, in fact, during the negotiations, Greece tops the list of uh, in the main enemy question for both ethnic Macedonians and ethnic Albanians. They are quite low, 28% for ethnic Macedonians and 11% for ethnic uh, Albanians, but Greece is at the top uh, in, this, in this question. Then uh, go back to March 20, uh, 2016, would you accept the name change in order to join EU and NATO? Uh, most uh, two thirds of the respondents say no, but of course we see the big difference between ethnic Albanians here uh, where uh, two thirds would like to see a name change and uh, more than almost 80% of ethnic Macedonians who would reject changing the name in order to join EU and NATO. Um, then the next question again from a, a few months before the start of the negotiations, if a party compromises with Greece to resolve the name uh, issue, will that affect your attitude towards that party? Uh, 33, almost uh, one, th one in every three uh, respondents said yes, and it would be a negative, uh, negative uh, attitude towards that party. Um, and then we see the changes at the initial phases of the negotiations. This is January 2018. Uh, the, the issue has been raised only a couple, a couple of a few months before and we have started the official negotiations between the two sides, and we see a clear difference in the picture. Do you now support uh, the solution to the name dispute, to the name issue, aiming to enter EU and NATO? 
in January 2018, uh, six out of 10 respondents say um, uh, yes, support the name change. Uh, a bit balanced between yes and no when it comes to ethnic Macedonians, but still more ethnic Macedonians want, would want it to change the name in order to join EU and NATO. And of course, 95% uh, uh, overwhelming support for the name change among uh, Albanians. Um, a crucial question, especially for the way that uh, the, the agreement and the provisions were framed or the, the, uh, the importance of the agreement was framed. Um, is there a ch if there is a change in the name, will this mean a change in the meaning or identity of Macedonia and the Macedonians? Uh, here we see that uh, more than half of the respondents uh, thought that yes, when you change the name Macedonia uh, of the, the name of the country, that would mean also the change in the identity of Macedonia and Macedonians. And six out of 10 ethnic Macedonians think so. Uh, the opposite is the case when it comes to ethnic Albanians. And here, fast forward a, a, a few months, we are at the, just a few weeks before the, uh, the, uh, the agreement is reached. Uh, but of course, there is now by then enough information. Uh, all respondents are pretty much uh, know the difficult compromises that have to be made and they're not very happy with them. And we already see that the, um, the, when the, 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 those polled asked whether they would, uh, what they would accept in terms of the, 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 name, the, the solution to the name issue, uh, almost one in two say they would like to see no change in the name of the country. And then uh, what you see as with the, with the uh, arrow here, four out of 10 consider the least acceptable solution, the Erga Omnes, which was of course the solution that would be agreed upon only a few weeks after this poll. Therefore, you see the frustration with the forthcoming solution. I mean, uh, uh, respondents in North Macedonia are ready for something that uh, are expecting something that they really do not like. Um, another way to see this, the uh, Erga Omnes solution that was agreed upon in the, in the, in the, PRESPA, uh, in the PRESPA agreement uh, receives only 14% uh, acceptability as a solution, very low, of course. Uh, change of constitution, again, unacceptable. One in two did not want to change the constitution um, and so on and so forth. There's more data, every single of the, of the major issues that were negotiated and were agreed upon in PRESPA, we could see in May, 2018, that were highly contentious and they were uh, more or less rejected by a, 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 big, uh, a big percentage of the uh, Macedonian citizens both ethnic, ethnic Macedonians and ethnic Albanians, and maybe a glimpse of hope uh, on the question, uh, is you, uh, whether you would prefer EU and NATO or keeping the name Republic of Macedonia, one in two answered, yes, we would prefer EU and NATO, therefore change the, the name Republic of Macedonia. But of course, what is important here and is important generally for the framing of these issues is that it does not endanger the Macedonian identity, culture, and language. So this was very important also to understand why some of these provisions were included in the, in the final text of the PRESPA agreement. And moving on to the more rejections and more negative side, which is the Greek. Of course, these are uh, two opinion polls, one in 2016, a few months before the, the start of the whole process, several months before the start of the whole process, and just uh, 2018 during the negotiations. Uh, the no reference to the term Macedonia, which is, of course, goes against the official position of the Greek government, which already from the mid 20s, uh, mid notes, uh, is that uh, Greece accepts uh, the term Macedonia with a geographic qualifier. The majority of Greeks do not want any reference to the term Macedonia. Back in 2016, it was 57%. It goes up to 72%, 15 percentage points up when the uh, actual negotiation started. So the public opinion becomes even more rejectionist when the negotiations start. Um, again, 2018, six out of 10 Greeks think that if the term Macedonia is used in the name of the neighboring country, that means that in the future there will be a territorial threat uh, against Greece. 
very interesting. Greeks also do not trust those Western partners and allies that are involved in the facilitation and have uh, uh, pretty much, I would say, helped Greece in this process. Only 6% of Greeks think that the EU uh, favors Greece. Only 5% of Greeks thinks, think that uh, the US favors Greece. Only 6% thinks that, uh, think that Germany favors Greece, where, whereas uh, 20, 32%, 38%, 34%, 29% consider that uh, EU, US, Germany, and so on and so forth actually support or favor North Macedonia. And to close this uh, chapter about the opinion polls, of course, is also a criterion, uh, uh, something that determines the vote uh, according to some respondents. Uh, at least one third consider it an important uh, parameter for deciding how they vote. Uh, um, I mean, whether a government agrees on the name dispute or not, uh, and then another 22% say no, uh, uh, say somewhat important. Now, um, so this is the, the situation when it comes to the public opinion. And, uh, and, uh, and I think it's very clear that it's a very negative uh, uh, the public opinion presents a very negative, a high, a big obstacle to any agreement. But also, I think uh, I have established that the business as usual path was anything but unreasonable. In fact, it was quite a reasonable option for, uh, uh, for, for many people and, and policymakers at the time. There is, however, a catch in this. And let me recount here a story to illustrate the point. It is from a, from a workshop that was held uh, only a couple of months before the start of the official negotiations, I was present in that workshop, uh, and most of the participants were from North Macedonia. During that event, a colleague from North Macedonia used the notion of a diplomatic nuclear weapon to describe Greece's leverage over North Macedonia due to their successful blocking of EU and NATO accession. And by using the analogy of the nuclear weapon, I think this colleague expressed in, in, in very graphic terms the enormity of the diplomatic obstacle that Athens presented to Skopje. Um, and this was not, uh, I remember in the workshop, and I can imagine also back home, not fully understood and not fully appreciated and accepted by participants. Many of the participants at the event downplayed the capacity of Greece to continue blocking in the long run. Therefore, they did not accept the imperative for, uh, for negotiations, while others overestimated the ability or the willingness of Western partners to arm twist Athens into accepting Skopje membership in Western institutions. And what I would like to argue here as a making a bit more, offering a bit more nuance or the cuts in the discussion is that indeed I agree that there, there is such thing as a diplomatic weapon, diplomatic nuclear weapon that Greece retained during all this time uh, of, the, of the friction with, with North Macedonia. But at the same time, if we are to continue using these Cold War analogies, there was also some sort of mutual assured destruction there. The Macedonian side maintained also its own nuclear weapon, even though not as clearly visible as the Greek one. So how was that the case? Given Skopje's soft success, but uh, quite important success in consolidating the broad international use of the term Macedonia, Athens, before the negotiations was presented with no other pathway for convincing its neighbors to agree on a deal other than through the process of acceding to Western institutions. Greece's so-called nuclear weapon, therefore, could evaporate if the prospect of membership to Western institutions were to be taken out of the picture. This was effectively North Macedonia's own nuclear weapon, although not very visible always to observers or even to Greece. And there were several ways, I think, through which uh, uh, this could come about, some more realistic scenario than others. If, for example, for domestic or foreign policy reasons, Skopje were to decide not to join Western institutions, think of a Bosnia scenario. 15 years ago, NATO membership was fine. Today, it's, it's so contentious that it becomes almost unthinkable. Or if geopolitical bickering in the region were to intensify to, to such an extent, heighten so much that it would make NATO, uh, accession to NATO or EU uh, much less likely or contingent on the Russian consensus. Or 
as uh, could have been, I think, uh, a more likely scenario among the three. If populist and anti-enlargement forces in Western Europe were to grow in strength so much so that they could put an effective hold in further EU widening, any of these three scenarios, especially the third, would actually dissolve Greece's diplomatic advantage, leading to the following predicament. Skopje would be, would be left out of the EU and NATO or out in the cold, as uh, Nikola Dimitrov has put it on several occasions. But at the same time, they would have kept the international use of the term Macedonia with no incentive, of course, to ever negotiate with Greece. And it would have been a failure for Greece on the name issue front and a failure for North Macedonia on the front of the membership in the Western institutions, a mutual failure or a mutual assured distraction of sorts. Now, having introduced this, this dimension, I must say that these ideas did not necessarily resonate in the public dialogue in the two countries. I know for, for a fact that it, they were not visible in the Greek public discourse. And whether in fact this perspective played some role in the decision-making process uh, of either actors is something that I will in investigate in the project in the coming months. So stay tuned, please. Uh, now, I do not have the time, of course, to provide an analysis, even a preliminary analysis of all three policy phases that I want to cover in my project. So let me offer just a few thoughts today only on how the two leaderships decided to embark on the negotiations before I, I try to, to draw some more general conclusions. And, and of course, how did they embark on negotiations? I think both domestic and international policy calculations have played a role. On the side of North Macedonia, the paradigmatic, the, the catalytic change with the fall of the Gruevsky regime made things easier. The Gruevsky government antagonized Greece from day one. And especially after the debacle in, in Bucharest, I think it entered a collision course with Athens and increasingly also got alienated from other Western countries. Now, after the culmination of the crisis that we all know led even to violence in parliament, we have a new Zayf government uh, with the support of the West that comes to power. And from the beginning, uh, the Zayf political program aimed to revitalize European integration and the membership in NATO. In fact, the entire policy agenda, I think, of the new Zayf progressive government was fully conditional on the country getting back on track with, when it comes to EU and NATO membership. And domestic stability, relations with ethnic Albanians, rule of law, economic rejuvenation, just to name a few of the key policy areas or key programmatic visions of the new government were all contingent on the country's European and Euro-Atlantic integration. Uh, for, all, for all of these, and of course for both uh, uh, NATO and NATO, uh, EU and NATO, Greece could stand as an obstacle. Thus, finding a modus vivendi with Greece was certainly among the top priorities for Zayev. However, and I think this is very important, it is a, it is a usual misconception made that Zayev government entered negotiations without much hesitation. In fact, my research uh, so far has found that the key foreign policy actors, and I mean the top layer of the foreign policy actors in the country, hoped initially that, initially that they would not need to go to a quick deal in Greece in order to unlock the integration process. The initial expectation was that um, membership in NATO could be achieved with a temporary name FIROM. And of course, also the, the start of accession negotiations could be granted to, uh, to the country in order to help the, the new progressive government, which of course wanted to deal with Greece, wanted to have good relations with Greece, but it needed some sort of support on the part of the EU. Uh, now these hopes were quickly dashed when uh, it became clear that Greece was not very willing to be more lenient towards the new government of Skopje, but also when both the US and the EU, I think made clear that they prefer to see clear cut solutions uh, when it comes to the problems with Greece. Um, I think another important factor here is that the key actors in North Macedonia at the time did not necessarily expect that the negotiations would lead to a comprehensive far reaching agreement as it did with the PRESPA. I think the experience of past rounds of negotiations under the UN with the UN mediation could easily lead someone to the conclusion that the key controversial uh, for North Macedonia problems, issues like Erga Omnes or the constitutional change could be avoided or there was uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, hope that uh, through uh, proper negotiation could be left out of, the, out of the deal. Now, 
Turning to the Greek side, I think it, it is somewhat more difficult to explain the Greek decision. As I have mentioned earlier, the consensus in Greece was that the issue was diplomatically parked and that any reopening by any government would bring more damage than good, at least for the government. Foreign policy, let alone resolving disputes with neighbors, was not high on the agenda of the first Greek leftist government. One reason was because the absolute priority, of course, was to renegotiate the bailout agreement with European creditors, which, as we all know, failed miserably. Uh, it is also because the new leftist ruling elites had zero policy experience and pretty much lacked any foreign policy knowledge. And, uh, uh, and in fact, at the, when, when Syriza made uh, formed government, the foreign policy was initially wholesale offered to the uh, only politician who was experienced in foreign policy, and that was Nikos Kodzias, the NFA of the new government. But of course, you have to remember that Nikos Kodzias was much more conservative in foreign affairs than anyone uh, that, and the, that anyone would expect from a leftist government. For example, it was very tough on the Cyprus question and, and pretty much led uh, the negotiations uh, in, in Switzerland to, to, to near failure. Moreover, Syriza ruled in coalition with the ethno-populist party independent Greeks, whose political discourse was highly nationalistic and hostile towards Balkan neighbors, and of course, especially uh, North Macedonia. So when um, Syriza comes to power, the idea of resolving the main dispute was totally, totally out of the radar. Intriguingly, it was the failure of Syriza's strategy to renegotiate uh, with the creditors. So the, uh, the, the, the efforts and the failure at another front that, uh, that brought the issue higher in the agenda or brought the issue in the government's attention. For a hard left party, the failed strategy of confronting foreign creditors, which ended in a third and heavier bailout agreement with very heavy conditions, was really unbearable uh, politically, some would even say psychologically. So without much space for shifts in economic policy, which was set in stone because of the bailout agreements, Syriza started to explore policy moves of either high impact or high symbolism uh, that would allow, allow it to strengthen its own battered leftist identity. And striking a deal with the Zaev government, a very progressive le center left government of the region on the name dispute offered such a possibility. And for Syriza's leftist audience of, audience, of course, the name issue was not of cardinal significance as it was for conservative voters of Nea Demokratia. Uh, moreover, uh, Tsipras as a prime minister after the showdown uh, with Europe in 2015 was open to ideas for mending relations with Western partners and very early on the Americans and the Europeans signaled to the, to the government in Athens that they want to support the new government in Skopje and they thought it was a good idea of course that this issue was finally resolved now that there is a, a, a good government that they can agree on in, in Skopje. Uh, we should also take into account that uh, relations with Turkey started to turn in very sour after the coup in Turkey. Uh, and we know, all know uh, how uh, difficult the situation has become and has escalated in, in, in recent months, of course. Now, um, overall, the settling of the name dispute was expected to bring political cost for, for, for the Greek government, but it was not, and it was not, of course, a major programmatic item, but the domestic and international circumstances made it a very appealing prospect. Resolving the dispute was expected to bring international dividends for the Syriza government, also for the Prime Minister Tsipras. And at the domestic front, the government was hoping to keep political cost at a reasonably low level. And even score maybe some political points if it was successful in the negotiating process so that they could get some concessions from the other side that previous governments have not achieved uh, in as far as we know from previous negotiation, side, negotiation rounds. Now we'll skip the uh, even if you agree the theoretical insights and the framework that I'm planning to use in my, um, in my, uh, in my research. Maybe we can discuss this at a later stage or during the Q&A. And I will uh, go fast forward for maybe five or seven minutes to round up and close by returning to the title of my, my project for the Institute for Human Sciences. Is there a Southeast European way of settling disputes or should there be one? And uh, I would try uh, 
a few preliminary co conclusions, which are very preliminary, of course, because I have only started, about the first question, the, is there a Southeast European way? Uh, one task that I expect to emerge as important in my research in the coming months is to conceptually and analytically dissect the ways in which the policy environment of disputes is distinct in Southeast Europe. That is because in other areas, the membership perspective is not present, and also because the international community has have not had the overpowering presence uh, in other regions as they have ha they had had or they have had in post-conflict Balkans. My hypothesis is that the membership perspective transforms the policy environment to such an extent that it becomes a defining feature, uh, and also for all conceptual as a result for all conceptual analytical or even policy purposes. It is not very useful to compare cases from both sides of the cleavage, both in places where you have members perspective and other places like the Middle East where you don't have a members perspective or the caucus for that matter. I think the key difference between the role of the EU in Southeast Europe and in other regions is the members perspective and that members perspective greatly increases the availability of tools and the potential for influence associated of course with enlargement and European integration. The members perspective potentially empowers or disempowers, offers formal or even extra institutional tools for influence. And at the same time, the conditionality and the political pressure associated with the members perspective, it's important to remember, offers a great potential for hijack. And this hijack is not easy to be prevented or curtailed, especially in cases where major member states do not have a great interest in putting a check on undue influence. Thus, I think, Analytically and politically, it is not certainly very useful to compare a dispute in the Balkans with a, with a dispute elsewhere. In contrast, uh, and this is interesting because of the latest developments when it comes to Turkey, it is more insightful to consider comparisons with disputes involving Turkey. Both, both, because, we can, both because we can draw a comparative framework between the period when Turkey had a realistic membership perspective some 20 years ago and today, of course. And also because it may illustrate the dynamics of power asymmetries with member states. For example, there are cases where power asymmetries may be offset by other factors, maybe as in the case of Turkey, versus cases where such asymmetries are more pronounced and remain unchecked. Overall, I think the trend in the process of EU enlargement is towards more rather than less politicization. This has become evident also in the trials and tribulations of North Macedonia succession process since the signing of the Prespa Agreement and everything that's happening these days with, the, with North Macedonia, of course, is, is clear evidence uh, for that. The role of member, member states is growing and of course the new methodology will make, it, will make the process even more political. We should thus expect that in the years to come, the scope for political influence in disputes on the part of member states will also grow. We should expect that it will grow. Thus, to summarize, the Europeanization of disputes has a very particular meaning in Southeast Europe, or a Southeast European way of settling disputes could be one where the role of membership perspective is a powerful tool, but also one where such power and influence is not fully regulated and is contingent on the constellation of interested parties and influence, or on whether these influences are aligned or not, or in what direction they are aligned. It is also an ambiguous role. Uh, European integration certainly placates sides in a dispute and pulls actors away from military escalation, escalations or even from serious diplomatic and political rows. But at the same time, the same circumstances make the politics of solution more complex, increasing the number of intervening factors as well as potentially contributing to new power asymmetries that were not in place before the membership perspective appeared or changes to the initial balance of power. And uh, closing, discussing the second question, the should there be one, which is more like action for the future, some preliminary ideas again, which I hope to revisit in the coming months on the basis of my research. I think both policymakers and analysts need to be even much more conscious of the catalytic role that the membership perspective and the potential for hijack and influence on the balance of power and power asymmetries has. One answer to this could be to design alternatives, maybe tools and political initiatives that may offset 
the potential negative side effects in building the accession process. Of course, somehow without threatening the existing member states who will not be, which will not be willing to, to, to for, uh, have uh, power and leverage for go. Uh, another idea could be that the EU may have a greater formal role in the process of settling disputes. The European integration process indeed offers great incentives for reaching settlements, but also for changing the political dynamics, as we said. And at the same time, we should remember that the EU does not necessarily have a role in the process, not even as, uh, 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 not even as one of, uh, of, of the facilitator. It may or it may not be involved in the process. Um, so it is, the EU is often even absent from managing the very policy effects that its own policies and tools produce. Therefore, we may find, and this is something to discuss in the future, that we need even more Europe or more EU rather than less when it comes to uh, problems and solutions in the Balkans. But this, of course, we have to discuss more in the future. I will close it here. I hope I didn't uh, go beyond the 40 minutes even. And I uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Ioanni. Uh, no, you didn't overshoot. You, you were just within the limits. Uh, a huge thank you for this uh, presentation, which, as you were speaking, reminded me that you know of a, of a great painting called The Lesson in Anatomy. Uh, you really took us deep down uh, with uh, your surgical tools to understand the complexity of the issues that was addressed. Uh, you know, the, the saying goes, what's in a name? Uh, the most recent comparator uh, is uh, this town in Canada called Asbestos that had to change its name. You <laughs> In that, those of you who follow world news, and they've they had a, a referendum where the people decided that it would be well of sources. So, um, just with those of, of our participants who are not fully aware of the statistics, Greece is a country that's five times bigger in population, whose GDP is nearly 20 times that of Macedon, North Macedonia, 20. $220 billion compared to $12 billion, and the GDP per capita of Greece is $20,000, and that of Macedonia is $6,000. So again, we realize that, uh, if I could put it very metaphorically, but maybe I won't because it's too brutal, Greece uh, could overpower Macedonia if there were, God forbid, a conflict uh, you know, during the morning. Um, and yet we see that the name issue is a, a very deep and ingrained identity issue. And uh, I think it, it need, we need to simply remind ourselves that it requires the courage of leadership. You mentioned the names, but I think we need to repeat them. The prime ministers of North Macedonia, Zoran Zaev, and of Greece, Alexis Tsipras, and their foreign ministers, Nikola Dimitrov and Nikos Kostrias, really uh, stepped out in front. And as you so eloquently showed, both in what you said, but also with the opinion polls, with public opinions that were greatly against what was going on. And that is what I think this element of leadership, uh, and I think you described the political environments in both countries very well to see how we came uh, to this. The, the American uh, mediator, Ambassador Nimit, Matt Nimitz, uh, who stuck around for, and just to remind it, this is something that's lasted about 27 years since 1992, when uh, the Republic of, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, as Yugoslavia broke down, became the Republic of Macedonia. And you reminded us that 100, 50 countries had recognized it under that name, but we were not out of the woods and reminding of the Bucharest NATO summit uh, of 2008 is extremely important because again, you know, counterfactually had Greece then accepted Macedonia to come in under the Firon name would have made things easier. But th there are many, many questions um, that I would like to address. I'll, I'll hold my fire. Um, but uh, I'd like uh, all of you to use the chat function uh, to ask questions and um, uh, you have been asked to, to share if you possibly can the public opinion poll, Ioanni, um, uh, um, with us 
uh, in an email, we can share it with, with those who were, who were participating. But uh, the first question comes from Katka Kasabova, uh, our fellow um, uh, of this year, your Futures Fellow uh, author, who will actually be presenting next week. She says, uh, Ioannis, many thanks for this. Has there been public discussion in Greece of the legacy of the Greek Civil War and how that may be linked to the name dispute with their neighbor. So uh, I'll give you the floor. Uh, thank you, Kapka. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, and it's, it's one that is difficult to answer because um, there's not one answer to this, to this question. Obviously, if you, if you look at the side of North Macedonia, this is a very traumatic and, 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 and a very important issue because it involves family relations and historical narratives, historical traumas uh, of, of uh, many people who have left Greece uh, during the civil war and, and all the, you know, everything that comes together with, with, with refugee dom, uh, literature, trauma, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think this, this aspect of, the, of why this is an emotional issue in North Macedonia is not understood in Greece, except among uh, circles of historians. There's very little debate of uh, of the of the importance of this of this traumatic experience for our neighbors, uh, ethnic Macedonians in North Macedonia. Uh, even though Greece is also a country that has uh, suffered uh, a trauma as a result of refugee dom, and of course, a big percentage of the Greek population are descendants of refugees from Asia Minor and elsewhere, or from the Balkans or the from the Black Sea. Um, I don't think there is enough understanding for other people's plight. Um, and uh, when there is a discussion, public discussion in Greece about the civil war, it's always about how uh, uh, Slav Macedonians of Greece, those have left Slav Macedonians of Greece who left, were the ones who wanted to take uh, away part of Greek territory and, 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 and cede it to Yugoslavia or, or do whatever. So it's always about a negative aspect of history and never about well, what happens with these uh, with these uh, with these people who left and their memories and their places of, of origin and their families and their grand grandchildren, etc. Um, having said that, uh, there are uh, aspects of the Greek uh, experience that is also traumatic when it comes to the Greek civil war, but that relates mostly to uh, populations in northern Greece. Of course, the trauma of the C Greek civil war was not only for the Slav Macedonians who left Greece, but also for Greeks who uh, fought the war there, for those who saw part of the territory being threatened uh, with a carve up, uh, deaths. Uh, so it, it's, as, as in every war, there is two sides to the traumatic story. Uh, and, uh, and this has been reinforced over several decades during the Cold War because Greece's northern borders, of course, were sealed off because of the Cold War. And, and somehow the Northern Greece was a frontline uh, area with very vivid memories or memories that were keep coming back, uh, 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 memories of the, of the Civil War. So in Northern Greece, this is quite uh, important and quite vivid. And it is being reminded through literature, through intellectual work, through media, etc. Now, I don't think the civil war and the experience of civil war, there is uh, many uh, southern to, to, to Greek Macedonia, southern uh, from central Greece and, and, and towards the south that know much about the civil war or they realize the connections. Uh, those who read more, maybe yes, but I think the Greek civil, the civil war legacy is, is more something that uh, pertains to the experience and the feelings and emotions and the trauma of, of Northern Greeks. But uh, Kapka, this is uh, several different layers and several different levels. And uh, there's not necessarily always understanding of the other people's traumas and plights, eh? um, as I mentioned. Thank you, Kapka, for, for raising that question. Clearly, as uh, Yanni said, the, the, the trauma of the Greek civil war, and obviously uh, those of us who are from former Yugoslavia uh, know uh, all, all that history of who is followed as, uh, as Tito's regime supported, of course, one side in the war and was uh, criticized by Stalin 
uh, for that, but also the fact that uh, the coming of Syriza to power, and you will correct me, Ioanni, was also seen as a sort of political revenge of those who had lost in the civil war. But let's, let's, uh, because- I will, I will comment on that later if we have time, because it's interesting. There's a question from Sirjan Svich, also our fellow, who's uh, basically a, a related question uh, that you mentioned in, in a piece you wrote uh, in 2019, after the ratification that you argued that Syria's motivations for going toward a high cost agreement with its northern neighbor was also in the realm of internal politics, which you mentioned, in fact, in your presentation, that it was a means to implement Syriza's strategic decision to dominate the center left in Greece for many years. Although it's probably too early to tell, uh, how, what's your assessment of that? Uh, yeah, it's a good, very good point, Sedzan. Uh, and <laughs> I co-authored that report, so, and we were together, I think, in, in, in working on this. So it's important. Um, uh, yes, I, I, I agree with that point. Uh, if I would write this, this piece differently today, which is how, how much, I think, two years uh, or rather almost two years since we wrote that report, is that uh, this um, element or this uh, factor grew uh, inside Syriza during the process. So I think my realization after investigating and being a bit more of these issues is that it was not a, among the initial um, uh, incentives, but as the issue became a policy issue, it became a, a, a cleavage between government and opposition. As the, there was infighting, there was fighting between government and opposition. It became a, an emotional issue. Uh, Syriza started to look for also uh, the uh, un un unintended consequences, which is some of them positive, some of them negative. And Syriza realized that this is an issue that make uh, more progressive politics for us and less progressive politics for the other, other side or more conservative politics for the other side. And therefore, uh, although initially Syriza was looking for something to offset the, the bad image of the agreement and maybe they didn't realize how important the name issue could become, as they negotiated and as this became more and more controversial and an issue of political in, uh, fighting with, with the opposition, they realized that this does have the potential to bring about or to generate more progressive politics for us or even attract members from uh, the uh, center or center left who were left um, without uh, party affiliation or, 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 or party, um, party home, so to say, because uh, the former dominant PASOK has, has stood against the agreement. So a lot of people felt, well, this is not the center left that we like. If PASOK is against this agreement, then we may need to look for other alternatives and Syriza could be one. But it's a, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process that led to the to this realization, it was not necessarily the, the core incentive at the beginning. Okay, the next question is from uh, Achilles Rakinas, who is the council of Greece in Bitola, North Macedonia, and who thanks you for the very informative presentation. A question about the mediator's role in achieving a compromise. How catalytic do you consider Ambassador Madnimitz's role in safeguarding the negotiation process for approaching uh, from approaching intractability? Um, very good question. I, I'm not entirely sure I have an answer to this, and I hope uh, this is one of my research questions to see how the, the two sides handled the legacy, including the people uh, of the previous rounds of negotiations. You may remember that um, at some point, uh, uh, and this was one of the milestones in the negotiation process, the, uh, the two governments decided to scrap the the two uh, negotiators that they had uh, negotiating in New York. Um, and for Zaev government, this was a, a very important point because the negotiator for the North Macedonian side was, of course, an appointee of the VMRO. So there was the feeling that they're not doing enough to actually uh, make serious breakthroughs in the, in the negotiation, negotiation process. Now, uh, having said that, I think the, the role of Nimitz was very important in keeping the, the issue on, uh, on the agenda for many years, especially the difficult years when 
the relations and the trust between the two sides had reached uh, uh, rock bottom, uh, especially during Gruevsky years. Uh, and, uh, and it's an unthankful job, of course, because I'm pretty sure every side thinks that the, the negotiator or the mediator is helping more the other side or is more lenient towards the other side. I and mean, this is classic in, in all negotiations. I know in Greece, uh, both Ambassador Nimitz and every other negotiator and, or every other mediator in our conflicts with or disputes with neighbors always is portrayed by media and is seen widely as working for the other side. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's an issue that I will be investigating more. I don't have a definite answer, but I think uh, Matthew Nimitz played a very important role, especially in critical times when the whole uh, process could have been derailed entirely or the, the trust between the two governments was very low. I think also, and but I don't have information about that, I hope to get, I think he was instrumental in bringing the two sides or building trust between the two sides at the very initial phase of, of the negotiation. Because of course you realize you have a new government in Skopje, you have a, a leftist government in Athens, but that does not necessarily mean that uh, by default, you have more trust between the two sides. Trust had to be built during the process. Uh, and the fact that the Greece was against Gruevsky does not, and, and of course, Zayef is against, was against Gruevsky, does not necessarily make uh, the Athens government and the Skopje government being, being more trustful towards each other. So that was quite critical, but more to, more to investigate in the coming months, I think. Okay, our next question comes from uh, Dimitar. I don't know whether it's Bechev or another Dimitar uh, who asks, how would you compare the response of the opposition in the respective countries to Prespa? Uh, Nea Demokratia made a U-turn, what of Wimere or uh, Depenome? Constitutional amendments in early 2019 saw some reshuffles within Wimere and Mitsotakis changed tack after coming to power. Important question. Very important. Um... Uh, let me start with the Greek side. Um, I think what we see uh, is clearly a, a new government that it, it feels that it has a hot potato in its hands because of the emotional load that this issue holds for its own voters, especially for the conservative right-wing uh, uh, voters. Um, also, it is a bit, uh, to some extent, hostage to the to how much it opposed the, the negotiations and the agreement when they were in opposition. Somehow they cannot turn around so easily today. But at the same time, having said the hot potato and everything, it does not seem to me as a government that wants to destroy the, the, the press bar agreement. Uh, quite the opposite. I think they show signs every now and then that they want to work with the, with the press bar agreement and build strong partnership with North Macedonia for many reasons, including, of course, the fear of Turkey and the, uh, the influence of Turkey in, in our northern borders. But every time we see the signal, uh, we see signals on the part of the, of the Greek government that they want to do more, we have the media going berserk. We, we have opposition by uh, uh, MPs from northern Greece. We have civil society associated with a, with a with the uh, Nea Democratia and conservative circles that, that, that start to shout, and then the, 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 the Greek government uh, rolls back. Uh, we had uh, recently another example, of three uh, um, protocols between uh, Greece and North Macedonia that uh, the government wanted to, to bring to the parliament for ratification. They started the process, they saw the reactions, uh, the media hype, etc., and they pulled back, and now they say, "Well, we will ratify the agreements later." Of course, that's not good news for the partnership between the two countries, but it does also show that uh, I think the leadership of the of the Greek government is would be in favour, but they are very much fearful of internal opposition or uh, the more patriotic or nationalist, whatever you want to call it, circles, whether in the party or in the conservative uh, audience. Um, now, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, <laughs> depending how you see it, we, the, the recent elections in North Macedonia did not allow us to, to make the same test with Vemero Depemene. 
And when I was making this, this uh, I was having such discussions with colleagues uh, from North Macedonia, many colleagues, in fact, before the elections, everybody insisted that there is there is no way that them or uh, would uh, try to to destroy the agreement or try to do any serious uh, harming to the agreement if they would come to power. Now I'm tempted to agree with that. I do, however, see, and I did so, and I was talking about this before the elections, a kind of soft, a soft danger uh, to this process. I think. I wouldn't expect the Vemero to, to try to annul the agreement, certainly not, but I would expect them to start talking much more about Macedonia, uh, uh, invest more in the rhetorics of, 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 the, of the old name and, and, and the pre-negotiations, pre-PRESPA uh, um, uh, symbolism, etc. And that would make, it, uh, would make Greece very uncomfortable. And I think if that, that was raised beyond the point and with all the media hype in Greece and the public opinion still very much against the press agreement, I think the Greek government would be forced to, to, to show its, its, uh, its uh, disappointment uh, or rather its frustration with the potential new government in, in, in North Macedonia. Therefore, I think for the longevity of the agreement, even though it has to be tested eventually uh, with all sorts of governments, it's better, I think, uh, it's good news that we still have a Zaev who is a, a, someone with serious political capital also in Greece at the helm. Um, but of course, it remains to be seen what will happen in the coming years. I don't know if that answered your question, Dimo. I'll, I'll uh, put the next two questions together from Bilena Vankovska and uh, Anna Kristinovska. Uh, they have to deal with the uh, announced Bulgarian blockage of uh, the opening of negotiations with uh, North Macedonia. Uh, Bilena puts the accent on uh, asking you to uh, comment on the interplay between Greek and Bulgarian nationalisms as opposed to the Macedonian one, which is seen as, as inferior. Uh, and uh, both these, in fact, overshadow the European values or the European foundation of the attempt to integrate the Western Balkans. How does this affect public opinion in Macedonia and attitudes towards the EU? While uh, Anna, uh, really her questions go to the fact of uh, the possible fragility of the agreement and what are the sustainability mechanisms that have been created so that the PRESPA agreement uh, runs and continues despite these opposed uh, nationalisms? Uh, two very complicated and, and, and very good questions, of course. Thank, uh, thanks to both Anna and, and, and Biljana. Um, I think uh, we agree that what we see today uh, with, uh, with, North, with Bulgaria and North Macedonia and also what we saw one year ago with France and North Macedonia is very unfortunate. Uh, and uh, and uh, if we were making counterfactuals, or I wonder if it would have been easy or even possible for the Zaev government to agree on a deal or even ratify the deal had, had the, um, the uh, ethnic Macedonian uh, electorate knew that uh, it would take two or even more than two years to start accession negotiations. I think it, it's, it seriously harms the, uh, the effectiveness of the of, uh, European policy in the region, but also it puts a big question mark to whether uh, uh, there will be enough trust to what is being said by Europeans in, when it comes to future uh, settlements or disputes. And this is I think an additional reason, and, 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 and it highlights very well the importance of the, uh, I think of the, of the questions I'm trying to investigate. Um, somehow, the European integration process enlargement has created a lot of good things and brings a lot of benefits to the region, including the potential for setting a dispute, but many other things. But uh, somehow it has created certain tools that can easily be hijacked by member states or can easily be used by member states to, uh, to, to pressure, to create more influence. Now, this will not go away. 
uh, I think. But what we need to do is understand the nuances of the process, understand how these tools are created, used, under what circumstances, what can be done by the EU, what can be done by other member states. Again, as I said in my talk, I don't expect that any member state will give away this leverage that every member state has when it comes to enlargement issues, because potentially anyone uh, will, will need to use this in the future. Estonia, when it comes to, to uh, Serbia's relations with Russia, you name it, we can, we can think of myriads of, of, of such connections. But in, we need to understand how this uh, undue influence or whatever you want to call it uh, works and whether the EU can do something to regulate it, not necessarily taking away the, 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 the consensus, because I don't think this will be possible, but finding ways, tools, uh, initiatives or involvement in the settlement of the process that would ensure also that the weaker side in this relationship, which has become very often weaker side as a result of the European integration process, as I think it became clear in my talk, does not feel alienated or does not feel betrayed if they agree on the press plan two years down the road, they still haven't started the accession negotiations. So all these, I think, are very important to understand. Power politics will not go away, but European values need to be reflected upon and somehow built in the process. Uh, and then Anna, I'm not sure whether she asks about the, well, she asks about the PRESPA agreement, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's two things in the PRESPA agreement. One is the, uh, the, the narrow regulation of the dispute over the name, which I think will, will not be um, in the near future put to, to serious test, I think. I think both sides want to implement it. The other is the, the, the partnership, the, the, the positive agenda. For me, the positive agenda is also very important. It's equally important to regulating the, the issues around the, 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 the name dispute because resolving the name dispute is one thing. The real promise of the PRESPA agreement is that it creates a, a, an engine of cooperation, an, an engine of building more trust between to former enemies, and we saw the data of the, the negative opinion that ethnic Macedonians had about Greeks and Greeks have about North Macedonia. And if an agreement and the positive agenda of the agreement can make good, good of this past animosity, this would be an excellent, uh, an excellent um, um, breakthrough and an excellent legacy for the region because identify the disputes and you will multiply several times the, 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 the animosities. Greece, Albania, we, today we had a, uh, a news that Greece and Albania will go to the International Court of Justice to regulate their own differences. Um, Bulgaria, North Macedonia, Kosovo, North Macedonia, Kosovo, Montenegro, you name it, there are countless of these little disputes that are not of the kind that you have in the Middle East or in the Caucasus, that can be resolved in the context of European integration process, but it needs to be done in a way that does not make the weaker side feel alienated, and then a positive agenda can be built around them. So yes, the PRESP agreement is an excellent example that has both the settlement of, of, the, of the core of the dispute and the, the positive agenda, but we need to work to implement the positive agenda. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ali, for <clears throat> reinforcing the importance of the role of, of the EU and the European Union perspective. I'll, I'll bundle two questions from Kirill, Kirill Brezov and Christian Filanowski uh, about the choice of the qualifier North. Uh, uh, Kirill says that uh, this was not the preferred option uh, for uh, Macedonia. How did the uh, Greek side choose it? and the North was officially declared unacceptable by Bulgaria early on by the Premier and Foreign Minister while named negotiations were still in progress. And secondly, Christian asks about your uh, opinion poll showed that the majority of Macedonians were open to a solution in 2018, even though most of them believed changing the name meant a change of identity. With this in mind, would you agree that the Macedonian government's framing of FESPA to the Macedonian public focus too much on defending against you sold out our identity issue 
rather than being uh, showing the pragmatic benefits from EU accession? Yeah, oh, difficult questions. Uh, for Kirill, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I think the North was the most, uh, uh, the, the, over the, the long period of, of different rounds of negotiations, the North, uh, together with Apple, was the, the name being popped up uh, every now and then. So it was a very common uh, 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 name that was always uh, used in, 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 in public discourse as a, as a potential solution. I think it came uh, right after a failed attempt uh, uh, or mismanaged attempt to, uh, to, to negotiate the crucible, the, um, the Ilindenska, uh, to, ag to agree on the Ilindenska Macedonia, um, something that Greek government initially thought could work, but then there was a huge backlash on, uh, on the part of the public opinion and the opposition, so they adopted. Um, I'm not sure that uh, there was too much thinking into having North or Upper or something else, the uh, Republic of Macedonia Skopje or something like that, because uh, arguably, and I think it's, uh, it's fair to, to imagine that the Skopje part would be dropped. Uh, I do, however, know that from the opinion policy North Macedonia, the North was one of the least, um, the least popular options. Um, there were other options. I think Upper Macedonia was a better option, uh, was a more popular option among, among uh, respondents in North Macedonia. So yeah, I don't uh, particularly know uh, for sure what, what happened. I would have to investigate and I'm not sure there, is, there was too much uh, reflection on, on, on the un unintended consequences. Now for Christian, I mean, the issue that I will be discussing among, uh, will be examining among other things is what happens with identity-based uh, uh, problems or disputes and how you handle identity-based disputes. And I, I'm working also with other colleagues, uh, including from North Macedonia, uh, on, on doing collaborative work on this. Um, one of the problem with identity-based uh, dimensions of the dispute, which is, of course, the way that this would work between both Macedonians and Greeks was the, or offset it with offering material returns. Um, uh, so it, it sometimes it can be even considered uh, as a, a, a kind of a, a offending if you say, well, you lose your name, which in your mind is your identity, but you get. Uh, you, you get investment from Greece, or you get better relations with Greece, which means you'll be you'll become uh, uh, you will have economic uh, growth, or you join the European. So overall, it's not easy to to respond to uh, identity questions with material uh, uh, material returns. Of course, we saw uh, among many other uh, features, uh, by the way, that this was framed in the referendum. That this was the main selling point of the of the govern of the Zayf government for the agreement. I mean, this was necessary in order uh, for us to ensure our European future. But at the same time, uh, and I, I, I expect to investigate more this issue. I think this explains very much the existence of the uh, of the North Macedonia side on including the Macedonian nationality and the Macedonian language in the provisions of the agreement. Something that was, uh, in fact, maybe it's not known, the main disagreement of the Greek opposition. And they said it shouldn't have been involved at all, uh, in, included at all in the, in the agreement. Or if we had to include something like that, it would, have to, it would have to have a geographic qualifier, North Macedonian language or something like that, which of course would have been unacceptable to the other side. Uh, so I see the uh, this as the final expect to find this as a final red line on the part of the Zayf government because a lot of things were included that I think the Macedonian side did not expect that would be included in the agreement but at the very end they had to draw a line and the line was well at the end of the day this protects our identity consolidates our identity and it's after 30 years of independent statehood the stamp that uh, our identity is guaranteed. Of course, 
Bulgaria is around the corner. So this is, becomes a different story now. But on the part of Greece and on the part of the PRESPA agreement, I think the identity element was also very important for, for, the, uh, uh, for the North Macedonia side. Thank you, Yoni. We have uh, 15 minutes left and I will close the list of questions. So please, if you uh, are with us and uh, have used the chat function, uh, I will close with, with the final question that is there. Um, so move, moving ahead, uh, we have a question from last year's uh, fellow Isabel Ioannides, uh, who thanks you for your super presentation and it uh, turns towards Cyprus. The Cyprus negotiations uh, case is a good source of food for those on the role of the European perspective. If, how, and when it can be a carrot, especially post Anan plan. This could be interesting to consider if there were problems with the implementation of the agreement. And second point, will you be also looking at the negotiations beyond the diplomatic actors? What has been the role of the media and the church? Yeah, I'm working on the role of the media and, and other actors. Uh, it's, uh, it's a book project. I don't know if I have mentioned it. So I'm, I'm very glad that I, I will be uh, discussing this with Ivan and many other fellows because at the end of the day, I hope that this will become a, 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 a good book, I hope, about the PRESPA agreement and the implications of, of, of the agreement for uh, the way the EU approaches the, uh, the disputes in the region. Um, I, so I will be looking on, uh, 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 on the other actors and I think the Church, the role of the church was more important in Greece than it was in, in North Macedonia, where my impression is that the church kept kind of low. Uh, that could be, uh, the part of the explanation could be also the fact that uh, there is a special status of the Macedonian church, which is uncertain, and uh, there is an, uh, an effort on the, on, the, on the part of that church to find an agreement with, a, with the ecumenical patriarchate and other Orthodox churches. Um, now, when it comes to Cyprus, and of course, uh, Isabel knows Cyprus much better than I do. I'm, I'm not an expert on, on Cyprus at all. But I think I mentioned in my talk, and I think it's important that um, there are interesting comparisons to be made uh, to the case of, of course, both, uh, of, of both Turkey and Turkey perspective, accession perspective, and of course, Cyprus. Uh, I think it's not it's not very useful to compare with uh, Middle East or the Caucasus places where the influence of the EU for various reasons is, is minimal. I mean, the EU can do many things, but it cannot have the influence and the, and the impact on disputes that it does have in places where members are involved and future members are involved. Um, and in the case of Turkey, I think it, it is very, um, I mean, very obvious that the, the um, the leverage over Turkey or the influence over Turkey has changed dramatically after the moment when Turkey realized that there is no future membership for them. Uh, and you remember there was a point 20 years ago uh, when both Greece and Turkey were very realistically discussing a, a, an overall comprehensive settling of all the disputes in the process of Turkey's joining the European Union. And back then, uh, and, and the old literature on the Europeanization of disputes have used this example extensively to show that the EU, of course, by offering a member's perspective in a structured and systematic way, can help uh, uh, resolve disputes. Uh, all this has, has gone down the drain, among other issues. Of, I'm, not, I'm not minimizing the role of authoritarianism in Turkey these days. And, 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 and the bombastic uh, personality of Erdogan and everything else. But uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is, is very difficult to, to imagine um, the uh, influence uh, on Turkey after the membership perspective was dropped. And it was not dropped by Turkey, it was dropped by, by our partners, European Union partners. Um, post Annan plan and negotiations, uh, is the um, web, sorry this uh, yeah uh, so I think what uh, uh, I guess what um, Isabel implies is how difficult the negotiations on Cyprus have become after uh, after the Annan plan was uh, failed and then uh, Cyprus joined 
uh, the government of Cyprus joined the European, well, Cyprus joined the European Union, and it has become much more complicated, uh, and, and trust was very difficult to be built. Um, I agree, uh, and I think uh, when it comes, especially when it comes to the PRESPA agreement, we are past the point where, uh, uh, long past the point where the uh, North Macedonia should have started accession negotiations. And I think if there is a further delay, this will start having serious repercussions and serious political cost, not only for the image of the EU, but also for the stability of this kind of arrangements. Um, uh, I think the EU has to realize that it was not only a bilateral agreement between Greece and North Macedonia, uh, uh, po e e political energy was invested on the part of, of the EU and political leaders of the EU, and therefore they, they have a stake and they have also co-signed, quote unquote, not really, but really they were involved in that process. So they cannot just pretend that they didn't happen or they cannot just pretend that they can delay indefinitely North Macedonia's succession process accession negotiations, simply because there are other, other regions now in, in, in the picture. Uh, and we shouldn't forget that the negotiations will take many years. There are many other issues that could can be resolved in that process, but the start has to happen. It would be a, a total failure for all those who believed in the press agreement and all those who believe that the EU can help uh, settle disputes in the region. Uh, Ioanni, uh, we have two more questions and I'd like to ask you one as well. <laughs> Uh, so if you could be brief in answering the, the, the last questions. The first one is, is I, I guess you could tackle shortly, it's the question of how does age uh, in public opinion polls relate to the attitudes that people had towards the possibility of an agreement, young, old, I guess, middle-aged? I, I, I don't remember the data from, from North Macedonia, but I can tell you in Greece that age is one of the few uh, indicators that make a difference. Uh, so if you would see uh, demographics of, the, of these issues, uh, it's pretty much a straight line everywhere, all over Greece, all age groups, all occupations, uh, everything, 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 except age does make a big difference. So younger people are a bit more open to, to uh, like having good relations with our neighbors. And also, uh, ideological disposition. The more leftist you are, some, the more friendly you are towards neighbors. And that happens also with Albania and others. So AIDS does play a role, okay. uh, at least in Greece. But I cannot remember the North Macedonia. Sorry, Simonida. Thank you. Uh, then there's a question from Alexander <laughs> uh, who says, how does the official uh, stance that Greece and Bulgaria do not recognize Macedonian ethnic minorities within their countries fit in all this? Secondly, Bulgaria disputes the Macedonian language. The EU seems to support this backward, to put it lightly, stance. My position is that these retrograde agreements are occupation by other means and a continuation of the policies of Megali, Idea, and San Stefano dreams. No wonder that the Macedonians rejected them in a referendum which was illegally proclaimed to be excess. The EU again supported this. So if you give a brief answer. Well, I, I would disagree with, the, uh, with everything is being said in the second part of the question, but I, I get the point. Um, I, I think, um, sorry. Uh, the, about the, the, yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I, I missed that. In, in both Greece and Bulgaria. Yeah, Greece does not, I, Greece does not recognize uh, any uh, Macedonian ethnic minority in Greece and, and, and uh, the Greek government uh, uh, thinks that the PRESP agreement also puts an end to this discussion um, in the sense that it, it, uh, the other side accepts that they will not meddle in the affairs of, of the neighbors and everything. Um, so this is uh, what the, uh, how Greece sees this, this issue. Uh, with, when it comes to Macedonian language, I think, um, I, I, I mean, it's not that, uh, maybe, maybe I, should, I, should, I should answer the middle, which I think is more important. I'm not sure the EU supports the, the, Bulgarian, uh, the Bulgarian position. I think the EU does not know how to handle this, this, these issues. Uh, and this is the, the point I'm trying to make in my, in my talk. The EU creates the conditions for certain 
imbalances in power or even blackmails, if you want sometimes, or hijack of, of these powers. But the EU does not have a, 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 a kind of elaborate thinking, elaborate plan of how to handle these issues. So it, it, uh, it offers tools which in every other the respect is very good and very useful and very beneficial, but at the same time it creates problems. But the EU does not know how to handle the problems that are created by the, its own tools. So I think this is something that has to be, uh, the EU has to do more in the future. Think of ways, uh, and, and it has to be creative and, and, and ways of not zero sum, zero sum uh, solutions, but uh, uh, positive sum solutions. And, and, and one of the reasons is because the disputes are so many in the region, uh, even if they're small or bigger, that we will have a multiplication of these kind of situations in, in every next round of negotiations, every entry in the EU, um, you name it, Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, Bosnia, you name it. Unless if we want simply the whole region to, to be in a stalemate because there's so many problems, but this is not my, my view. And I don't think this should not be the view of the EU. Very good, Joanny. And I will ask you a final question before we close. You talked about the positive role of external partners. Let me ask you quickly, a question about the negative or the spoilers like Russia, uh, who tried uh, by various ways to intervene in stopping uh, this deal. Uh, the kind of tip of the iceberg was the fact that the government of Greece under Tsipras had to expel two Russian diplomats uh, who were seen interfering both with civil servants and funding anti-Prespa um, anti agreement manifestations in the north of Greece not to mention their activity in North Macedonia. I, I, I agree that Russia was, uh, was, was not happy with the agreement. Uh, I, they probably uh, tried to, to, to do something to make it harder for the two governments to agree. But at the same time, I think the PRESPA agreement shows the limitations of the Russian influence. I mean, once you have two governments that are pro-Western, pro-EU, Wants to want to join the EU or, or are part of the Western sphere of influence, and, and and they subscribe to these values that want to resolve the problem, even at the uh, opposition of the entire society in Greece and big part of the society in in North Macedonia, even with hostile civil society or the hostile church in Greece, the problem can be resolved. The the EU and the US can help. The process and Russia cannot do much to to to, to block determined leadership that wants to, to 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 solve these problems. So this is a I think also a lesson for for everybody, both officials, policymakers, and us analysts, not to overestimate the role of Russia, which can be a spoiling. Uh, I think Dimo has done excellent research on on the spoiling role of Russia, but at the same time it has limits. It has uh, limitations to how much it can influence determined leadership. Thank you very much, Joanny. I, I fully agree with, with the, what you just said. I, I thank you for choosing this uh, theme as a research project, because I, I think, simply think that be, sort of beyond the daily deadline, uh, uh, headlines that it got, this is an extremely important historical case. The role of the European Union and by the same token, the United States was very important. Uh, those of us who, who are from former Yugoslavia and, and from, in, in my case, from Serbia and Belgrade, the, 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 the message has been hammered in from EU officials for the past 20 years. Uh, and that is that uh, we will not take in a new Cyprus, meaning you have to solve your dispute uh, with Kosovo, the, the belgrade Pristina talks, the Serbia-Kosovo talks, uh, you have mentioned others. I will mention very quickly that there was a, a dispute of sorts uh, that was resolved without any external help, and that was back uh, uh, in the early days of, of, the, of the democratic government of Zoran Djindjic and Kostunica when the Federal U Republic of Yugoslavia resolved or found uh, an agreement on the border with Croatia down in what was called the Prevlaka Peninsula. Again, a, a very uh, good uh, case study that is not much talked about. Uh, Goran Svilanovic was then the foreign minister of Yugoslavia and they, they found a, a modus vivendi 
that went forward, a story uh, untold in, in a larger context, which I think is very positive. But again, uh, the fact that, that we have uh, two leaders uh, and two governments of Tsipras and Zayev that have the courage with all the help that, that you so eloquently mentioned is extremely important and uh, gives, I think, motivations to others to, to find a way forward. And hopefully these, uh, you know, what I call, we are lucky to be geographically in Europe, which also means politically, culturally, historically and the rest, and it helps us move forward. So we look forward uh, to reading uh, the different uh, stages of, of your research and I thank you. And I just like to finish by announcing that next week, we will have our fellow Kapka Kasabova, renowned author uh, from Bulgaria, living in the United Kingdom, uh, who will uh, present, I think, an extremely interesting uh, angle on uh, her research project. So I, I urge you to, to join us for that. Ioannis, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ivan. Thank you. Looking forward to the next uh, event.